in Paul's letter to 1 Corinthians, he made a statement. He said that the things that I received, I passed on to you as of very first importance. That Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried, and according to scripture, he raised the third day. We have Christina Sims with us today. She made this public uh, to the church as well as I had the privilege of praying with her. And she asked Jesus to forgive of her sins and to come live inside of her. And so now I baptize you, Christina, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Does it work? This would be a good time to just tell you what a week we've had at Central Park. <laughs> now, uh, 8 o'clock Friday night, did anybody's power go off? Indicator? 7.30, 7.45? Well, it got some equipment at the church again. <laughs> we have no internet service in here today, so if you're used to logging on to our Wi-Fi, it's old school today, you'll have to use your Bible, all right? We can't communicate to the soundboard. I can't help you with air conditioning. All that stuff's out the window today. We're just having church, all right? So sit back. Enjoy the work of the Lord and the Holy Spirit today. Thank you for being in the Lord's house. We'll get these last few bugs worked out. While you stand, we'll shake hands, and we'll be ready to go in just a moment.
service, and we're going to go to the Lord in a word of prayer right now. We want to remember um, Bobby Breland, uh, that's Jonna's son. He's having surgery, surgery possibly right now, and so we want to keep him in our prayers. Also, Marsha Millweed, I think she's here today. Uh, her husband passed away, and we want to remember her as well. So let's pray. Let's go to the Lord and just ask him to bless our service today. Heavenly Father, we are grateful so much to you that we can come and be in your house, enjoy the freedom and expression that comes with worshiping your name. I pray right now that the Holy Spirit would descend upon this place and we would experience an outpouring of your desires for our lives. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you'll bless the choir and the musicians as they lead us through uh, music and uh, praise through music. And I pray for our congregation as they enter into this time of just uplifting the name of Jesus. As we lift Jesus up, I know that we'll uh, feel his very presence in our midst today. And so, Lord, that's what we're asking from you. If there's someone today who's never trusted in you, I pray they'll be saved in this service. If there's someone who needs to do spiritual business with you, I pray it'll happen today. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you.
greatest names in all of hymnody is Philip Bliss. <coughs> Philip was very instrumental in the gospel song movement. The hymns that were written to help teach the gospel. There are two things that make Philip a little bit unique from some of the other hymn writers. Number one, he wrote about 2,000 hymns. But that's even more incredible when you realize Philip died a very young and tragic death at the age of 38. So in his short lifetime, contributed not only a, a wealth of material, but helped invent or create or help make popular a whole genre of hymnody. Today we'll sing one of his best known hymns because it is taken from Brother Mike's text. Brother Mike is preaching today from John 6, I think 53 or 4 to about 69. In verse 63 of John 6, these words I have given you that you might have life. The words of the Lord are indeed life to us. As we wait here today for the Lord to work and move, in just a moment, Brother Mike will come to share with us, as Philip Bliss has written, wonderful words. And those words are wonderful words of life. Would you stand with me, please? We're on 338. We'll sing all three stanzas, wonderful words of life. Sing the You may be seated. Lily Beth's been rehearsing with us for two years now, and we finally talked her into singing with us this morning. All right? And she wore the perfect dress to match our blue shirts. So this morning, we're singing one of her favorites, Jesus is Coming Soon. Trouble sometimes I hear Filling men's heart fear Freedom we all hold dear Now is at stake Humbling your hearts to God Saves from Jesus. 
Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming soon, morning or morning night. Or night. Jet shall rise, rides me, rides me in the, the sky. Going when, going no, when no one dies. Heavenward bound, heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er. Happy forevermore when we meet on that shore, free from all care. Rising up, rising up in the, in the sky. Telling this world goodbye, home where we then shall fly, glory to share. Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming soon, morning or morning night, or night or night or noon. Many will many meet, will meet there. their doom, trumpets will sound, will surely sound. All of the all of the death shall rise, rides me, rides me in the, the sky. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night, morning or night or noon. Many will, many meet will meet their doom. Troubles will sound, will surely sound. All of the dead shall rise. Righteous meet, righteous meet in the sky, going where no one dies. Heavenward bound, heavenward bound, heavenward bound. child shall lead them. How about that? Tell you what, it's good to be with you today. You'll notice that I've picked up a little bit of a throat issue like some of y'all, probably from the uh, pollen that's in the air. Um, when I do that, when, I, when that happens to me, I, I generally put a piece of peppermint in my mouth. That's what I got in my mouth right now, if you're wondering. Several years ago, I had bought a new suit and um, had this kind of problem, and I reached down and pulled out what I thought was a piece of peppermint and put it in my mouth. I've learned that a piece of peppermint can last about 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes. And uh, that piece of peppermint never dissolved, and I kept preaching, and it never dissolved, and I kept preaching. I found out it was a button for that new suit. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, John chapter 6. John chapter 6, we are uh, in that famous passage that Phil's Phil uh, Bliss wrote about, uh, and um, today I want to I want to give you the basic, the real basics today. We're going to talk about why I believe in Jesus Christ. I, I want to give you four reasons today why I've committed my life and my eternity to the man named Jesus Christ, who is God come in the flesh. Um, I'd like for you to stand with me as we honor God's word and read, follow along. I'm reading beginning in verse 53, and basic text is taken uh, down there in about verse uh, 67 and following. This is what it says. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Now, can you imagine hearing that? And does that say, or does that help you to understand why the Romans thought that Christians were cannibals? When they heard Christians saying these words, they did not understand that what Jesus was talking about with his flesh is that he is the bread of life. You've got to hear it all in its context. And so he went on to say, um, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, 
your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. That's by the Sea of Galilee. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning uh, which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Simply meaning that you've got to have the conviction of the Holy Spirit in order to come to Jesus Christ. You don't come to Christ when you want to. You come when the conviction of the Holy Spirit is on your heart and on your life. That's why it's imperative when you feel that conviction that you respond. And then he went on to say, in verse 67, you do not want to leave too, do you? He's talking to his uh, inner circle of disciples. Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your word today. We're grateful for what it means to our life. And I, I pray in these brief moments that we'll glean truth from it, allow it to impact our lives and change our lives so that we can be more effective for you and I pray Lord again for your convicting power today for the Holy Spirit to descend upon this place and for a freshness and a newness to be in our life because we've spent time with you and I pray these things in Jesus name amen thank you have a seat there was a little girl who made her profession of faith and uh, she uh, was so happy about it and uh, she was telling everybody about the differences made in her life she was about 10 years old, and she was just so glad that she'd made that decision. She'd just been in Sunday school, and uh, she came out of Sunday school and ran into a, a guy in the church who was kind of a cynic, and uh, he was an older gentleman, and he, he was talking to a little girl, and he said, well, honey, uh, uh, what'd you learn in Sunday school today? And she said, well, you know, we learned a whole lot of stuff, but the main thing we learned is about the story uh, that tells us about how Jesus rose from the dead, and also about how Jonah and the whale is a representat representation of that story. And the old man asked the little girl, he said, oh, honey, you don't believe that story about a man who was eaten by a whale, do you? And she said, I sure do. And uh, the old man said, well, why do you believe that? And she said, because it's in the Bible. And uh, the old man said, well, that doesn't prove anything. And so the little girl said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah and I'll find out whether that's true or not. He said, what if you don't go to heaven? He's, and then she said, you can ask him. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Folks, I want to tell you something. There are a lot of people who are going to heaven, but there are more people who are going to hell than going to heaven today. The Bible tells us that. It sets our work out for us. It helps us to know that we have a tremendous responsibility to share the gospel. Oftentimes, people ask me, why do you believe what you believe? And I think that's a predominant question today in what we call the millennial age. There are a lot of millennials that are asking that question. Why do you believe what you believe? Because they really haven't based things on the belief that we have in the Word of God, and they haven't really tied it to the Word of God. Thank heaven for some of those committed millennials who do believe in the Word of God and do try to follow the Word of God and place their life in that. And so today I want to talk about that. I want to give you four reasons why I believe what I believe, but before I do that, I want you to look at your bulletin really quick uh, and notice that I, to start the message, I think it's important for you to know what I believe before I tell you why I believe it. And so I've given you s about six or seven things there, and I've given you a scripture, so you have an opportunity to do your own Bible study when you go home this week and find out and kind of reference these things. This is what I believe about Jesus. I believe that Jesus is God come to this world in the form of human flesh. You can look that, look that up, find it in John 1, 17 and 18. I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. 
I believe that Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. I believe that Jesus died a sacrificial death. Hebrews 10, 9 and 10. Uh, I, my faith in Jesus' power to forgive sin through his life and death brings me to forgiveness of my sin and eternal life for me. That's in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Jesus rose physically from the grave on the third day after his crucifixion. That's in Matthew 16, 21. And Jesus is coming to earth again in bodily form to judge the faithless and reward the faithful. Acts 1, 10 and 11. Now those are the things that I believe more than anything else. Uh, based upon no particular uh, denomination, no particular uh, group of people who might say one thing or another, I have found those things in the Word of God to be very true, and I've seen them work out in the lives of individuals as they've trusted Christ in faith. But the question still begs to be answered, why? Why do you believe what you believe? And I think it's important for us to answer that question today and know beyond a shadow of doubt why we do believe what we believe. And so I want to do that for just a minute. I want to give you four good reasons that you can give to other people when they ask you that question. First of all, I believe these things because of the impeccable character of Jesus Christ. Jesus had impeccable character in his life. Uh, he lived a sinless, perfect life according to Scripture. And uh, you know and I know that that is one of the things that allowed him to be the sacrifice for our sins. Um, when you stop to think about the life of Jesus Christ and you try to find a reference to that, you can always look, first of all, at the enemies of a man. The enemies of a man will try to tell you what a man's character is. Now, the enemies of Jesus were clear in the Bible. If you remember um, Pilate, when Pilate had uh, judged Jesus Christ and was commissioned with putting him on the cross, crucifying him on the cross, he said, I find no sin in this man. Now, that's an enemy of Christ who represented the Roman government and said, I don't find any sin in this man. And then you can also look at uh, the uh, uh, man Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Judas could find nothing wrong with Jesus Christ, and yet he was the one who sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And also, uh, if you were to look pretty deeply into Scripture, you would find out that there were individuals who uh, spoke and were paid off to betray Jesus Christ by the Pharisees and Sadducees so that they would have testimony and witness against Jesus. Those people were false witnesses and uh, could not give a true answer to who Jesus Christ was. In fact, they were more or less silent before the Sanhedrin to begin with until they were prompted to say what they were going to say about Jesus Christ. And so there were some false witnesses who gave a false testimony about Jesus. And even in that, we know that Jesus was exoner exonerated and that he was uh, made to be an example of a perfect, sinless life. But you can also think about his friends. If you think about uh, a person and their character and their life, ask their friends because your friends know more about you than your enemies do. For instance, when we look at uh, Jesus' friends, we know that Peter, Simon Peter, said, Christ is the Lamb, the unblemished and spotless Lamb of God. He testified to that impeccable character of Jesus. And then John, in his gospel, said, and you know that he appeared to take away the sin of the world, and in him there is no sin. John realized that in Jesus Christ, here was a person who had never sinned. And then again, Judas came back later and said, I have betrayed innocent blood, and uh, he hung himself because of that betrayal in his own life. So over and over again, the testimony of men in that day and that age was that here was someone who was sinless and perfect. Now I know what some of you are thinking. You're wondering to yourself, why in the world did Jesus have to live a sinless, perfect life? Because it was the only way for him to give a sacrificial death. In the Old Testament, if you remember on the Day of Atonement, what they did is they had a scapegoat and they had a sacrificial lamb. They took the scapegoat out to the wilderness and released that scapegoat and it was in the heart and mind of every Jew, they believed that that scapegoat was carrying the sins of the Jews out into the wilderness where God would forget them and remember them no more. But they also took that sinless, perfect lamb that was the basis of their Passover observance, and what they did is they, they slaughtered that lamb at the, at the entry place of the temple. 
And uh, what the high priest did is took that, lamb, that lamb's blood and poured it out in a bowl. And then he went through the holy place into the holy of holies, the most reverent, special place in the Jewish heart and Jewish mind. He took that blood to what was called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was a box. And underneath of that box, uh, there, there was a, what they uh, knew to be the, the presence of God and the specialness of God. And they believed that God's presence also hovered over the wings of the cherubim and seraphim that were on top of that box. Down inside of that box, there, were the, there was the law. There was a, uh, a jar that was full of manna. Um, and there was a rod that had budded. And they kept those things there. And here's what the Jews believe. They believe that when that high priest went in there, the only person who could go in there on the holy day that was called Passover, he would take that blood and he would pour that blood out on the top of the Ark of the Covenant so that when God's presence hovered over that Ark of the Covenant, he could not see down through the blood of Jesus Christ. They believe that for one year their sins were covered and God would not see their sins. But you know what happened? When Jesus came to this world as God's holy lamb, as his perfect sacrifice, Jesus did not cover our sins. He cleansed our sins. It's a vast amount of difference, folks. It's one thing to have your sins covered over and over and over and over again, and for someone to have to go in and slaughter an animal, pour that blood out every year over and over and over again. And it's another thing for one sinless, perfect Lamb of God to come from heaven, God's own precious Son, to come to this world and die for you and die for me and pour out his blood at Calvary, and now we can be cleansed from sin for all time. That's a good place to say amen, folks. I tell you what, that's one of the reasons I believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus had an impeccable character. Margaret Sangster was a psychologist of days gone by for Christian, Christians. And um, she helped a young cripple boy one time, a, a young boy that uh, was not able to walk. They helped him to get a job and helped him to get clothes and they helped him to be able to uh, perform different functions in life. And that young boy left the, uh, the tutelage of Margaret Sangster and he went off into life by himself and ended up becoming a bank robber. Margaret Sangster made this statement about that young man. She said, we, we taught him a lot about life, but we forgot to teach him how to walk in life. And it's more important for us to learn from the precious Savior, Jesus Christ, how we are to walk in life and learn how we can be forgiven of sins so that we can tell others about this sinless, perfect sacrifice, this one with impeccable character. That's one of the reasons that I believe in Jesus. Here's another reason. I believe in Jesus Christ because of his incredible claims. Now, if you have a Bible, I'd like for you to look at a couple other passages of Scripture for just a minute. Look at uh, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. You got that? I don't hear anybody turning. The most precious sound to a pastor's ears is the turning of the pages of the Bible. Okay? Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Jesus was involved in the creation of the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, just spoke about that, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. And then turn back to Colossians chapter 1 for just a minute. Let me show you another passage of scripture about the um, Lord and Savior and about how, about how in his life uh, he made some incredible claims. Colossians 1 and look at verse 15. Colossians 1, 15. This is what it says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. 
He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the first and the last, born from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy, or your, your Bible may say the preeminence. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here's the, here's the remarkable thing about Jesus in terms of his incredible claims. He claimed to be God in the flesh. He claimed to be the visible representation of holy God. Now, I don't know that anybody has ever really made that claim since that time and been able to stand behind it. Jesus is the only person I know of that's verified in the Bible. He's the only person I know of who lived the life to exemplify to the rest of the world, here is what God is like, and here is what God wants you to be like. You hear that last part? God wants you to be like Jesus. You say, I can't live like Jesus. Well, you can be forgiven of your sins. You can follow the example of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. God will make you more and more like Jesus day in and day out as you commit yourself in faith to him. You see, salvation is not just the process of walking the aisle, taking the pastor's hand and saying, I'm trusting Jesus today and then going into the baptismal waters. Salvation is also a process where you live the Christian life. It's called sanctification and one day you're going to die a death. Whether Jesus comes back or not, you may die and be planted in a grave, or you may be alive when Jesus comes back, as we heard sung about today. And one of those two things is going to carry your body to heaven, and you're going to receive a glorified body. Now, all of that is in line with the incredible claims of Jesus Christ who claimed to be God in the flesh. There's no other way for us to think about that. There's no other way for us to consider that. One writer said it this way. He said Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. In him we have acceptance. In him we have bounty. In him we have completeness and deliverance and eternal life and fullness and grace, holiness, inheritance, joy, keeping, love, meekness, nearness, oneness, position, quickening, redemption, salvation, triumph. We have union in Christ. We have vitality in Christ and wealth and excellence excellence and yayness and zeal. Now, whether you re realize or not, I just went through the alphabet and took a different word to describe Jesus Christ because Jesus said, I am the alpha and the omega. I am the A and the Z of life. I am the beginning and the end of your life. If you don't have Jesus Christ today, your life has a tragic end. The Bible tells us clearly and plainly that those who have not trusted in Jesus will spend eternity away from him. But the Bible also says you have the opportunity today to trust Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and have him change your life and make you to be like God. Charles Lamb made an unusual statement. He said, if Shakespeare were to walk into a room, most of the people would stand up to recognize him. But he said, if Jesus were to come into a room, Every well-thinking person would kneel down, and that's the difference. The difference between great men in this world who have done great things is that we stand up for those great men, but when Jesus comes, we get on our knees, and we ask God to bless us, and we ask God to, uh, to help us to praise him and to give him thanks and to exalt his holy name. So, folks, it's nothing wrong for you and for me to get down on our knees and to praise the Lord every day in some way, some form, some fashion. When uh, William Booth died, he left, uh, he was the founder of the Salvation Army. He left the Salvation Army in the care of his wife. And it wasn't too long until his wife became sick. And uh, so the lawyers knew that there was an important document that had to be signed in order for the Salvation Army's work to go on. They had brought this document by and asked Ms. Booth to sign it several times, but her mind was in and out and in and out and in and out. She couldn't just get that in her mind that she needed to sign that. Finally, right at the point of death, she was aware of everything around her, 
They brought that piece of paper, that document that was going to transfer the responsibility of the Salvation Army to somebody else. They put a pen in her, her hand and they said, please sign this or the work of your husband will die right here. She signed something on the piece of paper. They folded it up, didn't look at it, put it back somewhere. She died within the next hour. They went ahead and had the funeral, buried her body, and then the lawyers came back and they looked at the piece of paper. You know what she'd written on that piece of paper? Jesus Christ, the only name that means anything when you die, folks. That's the only name that means anything to us when we die, is the fact that we've given our heart, we've given our life to Jesus, who makes this incredible claim that he can give us eternal life. You know, when we think about the life of Jesus, on his mother's side, he was 12 years old. But on his father's side, he was older than his mother. On his mother's side, he was thirsty. But on his father's side, he was living water. On his mother's side, he had no place to lay his head. On his father's side, he was a home for the homeless. On his mother's side, uh, he was hungry. But on his father's side, he was the bread of life. Jesus was unique. He was different. And he could claim to be that way because he backed up those claims. Here's the third reason that I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ because of the incomparable contribution that he makes to my life. Now, I'm going to get down and get personal with you for just a minute. I don't know about you. I know about me. I know there have been times in my life where I haven't been near to God. I know that even as a pastor, there have been some times where I've been challenged about my closeness to God. But Jesus has given me something that I could never hope for from anybody else. First of all, he has given me a second chance at life. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't know how many educators there are here today, but you'll kind of understand this story if you've ever been involved in education like my wife has. There was a little boy by the name of Timmy. Timmy was the terror of his elementary school. And uh, he was the kind of kid that you wished would never have perfect attendance at school but he always did. And uh, Miss uh, Sparks was the teacher in the fifth grade, and uh, she knew that Timmy was coming to her class. She'd already been told that he was going to be in her class that year. And she was a Christian, born-again believer, and she started praying about it and said, God, how am I going to handle this young man? Word is that he doesn't know how to behave. He's belligerent. He doesn't do his work. Uh, his parents never show up for the parent-teacher conference. Uh, there's no way to really change this child. God, only you can change him, but let me be the vessel that'll, that you'll use to change this young man. And so uh, Timmy did come up to Miss Sparks' class in the fifth grade, and in Miss Sparks' class they did something that uh, teachers do a lot of that I think is a good thing. They all had journals that they wrote in. And uh, what they did is they every day, the first thing they did when they came in, they got the journal, it was sitting on a, a little shelf up there around the room. They, each, each child knew where to go to get their journal. Timmy's was up there, and uh, first day he got his journal down. He took a big black crayon and just made black X's all over that first page. Next day he wrote, I hate Miss Sparks. The next day he wrote, I hate school. The next day, uh, I hate everybody here. Uh, there's nothing to this school. Well, Miss Sparks knew that the only way that Timmy would change is if she loved him like Jesus loved him. You hear that? If she loved him like Jesus loved him. And so she started loving little Timmy just like Jesus would. The day ultimately came for the dreaded parent-teacher conference. And for the first time in the history of that school, Timmy's parents showed up. They came in. They sat down. Miss Sparks talked to him for a few minutes. Timmy was sitting in the back of the room because the parents couldn't do anything. They couldn't find a babysitter. No babysitter would sit with him, Timmy. And uh, so what happened was uh, uh, Miss Sparks, after a few minutes, said, well, would you like to see his journal? And uh, the parents said, well, yeah, we would. And so she said, well, let me get it. And she went over and pulled it down off the shelf. Well, Timmy was scared to death because he knew what was in that journal. He knew the black marks he'd made. He knew the ugly things he'd said. But he also knew that he had started writing some good things about school and some good things about Miss Sparks and about how much she loved her students and about how much she loved him. When the parents opened that first page, they said, Is this our son? And Miss Sparks said, Yes, it is. They turned to the next page. They said, Ah, oh, he's a genius. 
How can you believe it? We've never seen anything like this. And they just went page by page by page by page and praised him in a way he'd never been praised before. They closed the journal, put it back on the shelf. Mother and dad made their way out of the room, and Timmy was sitting back in the back hanging around. Miss Sparks got up and came over to Timmy. She said, Timmy, there were some pages in your journal early on that weren't very nice, weren't there? And he said, "Uh uh-huh. And she said, Timmy, I know your heart, and I know you didn't mean to write those things. And so what I did is I erased everything from those first pages, and I put something good on those pages. And when your parents saw each page, they saw what you meant to write in the goodness of your heart. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. In my life and in your life and in everybody's life, there's some black pages. But do you know what Jesus does? He takes his divine blood and erases all those black marks. He erases the sin of your life, and he gives you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance every time. That's the kind of Savior that we know and serve. Also, not only does he give me a second chance, he also has given me eternal life. You know, when I stop to think about eternity, that's a hard concept. I may have used this here before or not. I, sometimes I, I get, uh, forget about whether I've used this or not. But when I think about eternity, it's hard for me to even grasp the idea of eternity. But see if you can think about it this way. Imagine that a bird is sitting in the sands down in uh, Sandestin Beach. And that bird waits 10,000 years and picks up one grain of sand. And he flies all the way to the sun and drops that grain of sand, waits 10,000 years at the sun, and then flies back. Waits 10,000 years, picks up another grain of sand, flies to the sun, drops the grain of sand, waits, comes back after a 10,000-year wait. Someone said that eternity could be compared to the fact that after that that bird had carried every grain of sand from earth to sun and waited in between 10,000 years every moment, every time, eternity, after that bird had taken every grain of sand, eternity would have just begun. You know, the thing about it is, is illustrations fall apart most of the time. And that illustration falls apart at one point. Eternity will not have just begun because eternity doesn't have a beginning and an end. It's forever. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the fact that Jesus has given me the opportunity to spend eternity with people that I love and people that I know. And most of all, I'm thankful for the fact that when I get to heaven, I'm hoping Jesus will look at me and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you Lord and Master over many things. I believe that that's what Jesus has done for every person who trusts him in faith. Last thing, I think that when I think about Jesus Christ, I'm aware that there is inadequate competition. Every religion in the world, except for Christianity, says, Do this, do this, do this, and you'll be saved. Christianity does not say do this. Christianity says it's already been done. It's already been accomplished for you and for me. Let me ask you just to jot down. uh, So I believe in him because of the inadequate competition, the inadequate competition. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 through 26. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 through 26. And uh, this passage of Scripture tells that everything that's ever needed for you to go to heaven has already been done except for your response to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 20 through 26, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 26. This is what it says. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ, the first fruits, when he becomes those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father. After he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for we must Reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed will be death. The promise of the Bible is that our last enemy will be 
death. I don't know whether you know the name of Peter Schneider. You may or may not. Uh, Peter Schneider was a POW during the Second World War. He was a German soldier, and um, Peter had uh, fought for the Germans. He was captured. He was brought to America, and he was put in prison. And then uh, while he was in prison, he learned English. He was very fluent in the English language. He went back to Germany to live, and when Billy Graham went to Germany to preach crusades in Germany, he found Peter Schneider involved in the YMCA. He was one of the leaders in the YMCA there in Germany, and he found out that he had tremendous vocabulary in the English language. And Billy Graham spoke to him for a few minutes about his relationship to Jesus Christ and everything, and Peter said, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. And so he went to work for Billy Graham in Germany, and he became his interpreter in several different meetings, crusades there in Germany. And what happened was um, one day after one of the crusades, a person that Peter Schneider didn't know, never seen before in his life, came up to him after the crusade and said, Peter, are you a Christian? Schneider said, of course I'm a Christian. They said, on what basis? He said, I'm a Lutheran. Every German is a Lutheran, and I want you to know I'm saved. And the man said, I'm going to pray for you because I'm not sure you are. Just because you're a Lutheran doesn't mean you're saved. Folks, I want to tell you, just because you're a Baptist doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you are a Methodist doesn't mean you're saved. You've got to be born again by Jesus Christ before anything happens. Well, what happened was Schneider began listening to what he was interpreting. And after several crusades, he went to Billy Graham and he said, Billy, I'm not saved. And Billy Graham shared the plan of salvation. Peter Schneider got saved. And he said after that, Graham brought him to the United States and carried him all over the world. Peter Schneider said he looked every time out there in that congregation to see if he could see that man again. He said, I never saw him again. But he said, one day I'll see him in heaven. And I will thank him for asking me that question, are you saved? Folks, I want to tell you something. I believe in Jesus Christ because Jesus is the only way to be saved. Him and him alone. Well, this is an opportunity we're going to issue to you today. If you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, this is your time. This is your chance. You can accept the fact that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus died for your sins, and come and confess him today. If you're not a church member, God wants you to be a part of his church. Jesus is the head of the church, and God wants you to be a part of the church. You can come and make that decision today. You may need to come for rededication, or you may want to just come to this altar and pray. I, I don't know, but this is a time of inviting. It's a time for you to make public expression of private commitment. So as we stand together and we sing, uh, Brother David's going to lead us in our hymn. You come, make that decision for Christ today. I'll be here to receive you if you need to make a decision for Jesus. Come on quickly. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my Thank you once again for being here today. Um, if you're here and you're a visitor, we're going to ask you to fill out a little portion in our bulletin. It's a tear-off sheet. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering plate so we'll know who you are. If you'll give us that information, somebody from the church will contact you and tell you how glad we were in a personal way that you were here today. If you've made a decision today and you didn't feel like this was the moment you needed to walk the aisle and come and make that public, uh, just write, jot that down on this little tear-off sheet and drop it in the offering plate and we'll uh, be able to follow up on that right now. Our, our deacons are going to come down and we're going to receive our offering. I think y'all have 
Just sit down. Sit down for a second. Y'all be seated for just a minute. We're going to take the offer. Father, we come in your presence in the name of your son, Jesus, and we just praise your holy name. Father, we thank you uh, for this message that Brother Mike has brought this morning about the gospel. And thankful that we have it, Father, the good news. Uh, Father, we love you, and we uh, want to be obedient to your word. Help us to be witnesses, Father, to others about Jesus Christ. Take these tithes and offerings, Father, to the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and join hands as we sing the family of God as a fellowship chorus today. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel. back tonight. This hope will be